Are you hearing us? Yes, I am. Great. And I am. Again. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi barakatuh. May peace be with all of you as it is with me here in Kuala Lumpur. Wonderful. On behalf of the WCC Asia Pacific Region, 38th General Assembly 2020, and on behalf of the host country and Unaman Association of Uzbekistan, may I welcome each and every one of you to this webinar session on crafts. But on the dream side, it is like having a dream coming to fulfill all the dreams that I've had for many years. To meet and to hear Mr. Rajiv Sethi, to hear Dr. Michael Well, and to hear the Honorable Deputy Minister Aziz, to come together on this very momentous day in the life of the WCC APR. We have for you today at the webinar 2020 General Assembly will be to have Rajiv Sethi to take us on this amazing journey of crafts of India and the world because he is and he has been and he will always be the world's iconic treasure on crafts. So, Mr. Rajiv Sethi, I know you have such a long and beautiful things that you have done and things that have been said of your work. But I think I'm too humble to have to repeat them here in public. I would like to have you come on to present the, the paper on current trends in craft design and welcome you as the world's as the international iconic treasure on crafts. Mr. Rajiv Sethi. Thank you. Thank you, Raza. I have no idea whether I'm on in the digital space. Can you see me? Yes. Oh, I can see your beautiful self. Well, your beautiful great, soul. great to put a face on that amazing pers person that I've been hearing so much about. That's wonderful. Thank you ever so much. I really have been transported into another universe as I was watching 10 few minutes ago the dancers from Uzbekistan I recall my visiting there during the silk route uh, that I was preparing in Washington and uh, traveling all through Farhana and to Samarkand and to Bukhara and just completely transported into another world that had memories of my own country but uh, I began to understand parent civilizations and it was absolutely uh, a treat and I was transported and I thought I was back in the in the by lanes of Uzbekistan and I I'm still there <laughs> so I have prepared a, a, a video which might be an easier way to transmit these very complex issues that are being raised in the title of my uh, my presentation that has been given to me. So I have just played on those three words of, and I will explain this during the course of my presentation, not taking more time. Maybe you want to put that on so that one can straight away see the uh, 200 slides that I put together in a narrative, in a storytelling. And I recorded it and sent it to both to you, to Uzbekistan and to the Craft Council here in Delhi. I hope that all that work will be of some use and you are able to put it on. I was told that I would just come live and then you would put on that presentation. But uh, is it on? I mean, is it going on or would I be, would I have to improvise and say whatever I had to say? Um, we will ask Aziz to put it on now, Ms. Rajiv. Please, please. Thank you, Aziz. Thank you. I'm deeply honored to be here. 
and my most sincere gratitude goes to Dr. Gada, Mr. Ikromo, Raza Fuziaji, and my dear friend Manjri Narula. Uh, organizing this is a seminal event. My acquaintance with this prestigious organization through Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay dates back five decades. Some issues we had then with the World Craft Council um, went a little beyond semantics. The title given by the WCC for my intervention today, quite coincidentally, once again springs up unresolved terminologies. I'm to speak about current trends in craft and design. Coming from where I do, all three words, current, craft, and design, can be elusive. They often blur the universal message of a very critical movement. We're all gathered here to ensure the future of handmade, nurturing human skills, increasing the dexterity of this supreme instrument is possibly as important as saving the planet. Since India's independence, very few learning centers have come up dedicated to repositioning vital issues, the debate between art, craft, emphasizing the craft in art or art of craft, draws us away from the real search for the creative. When WCC started in the 1964, the well-to-do saw crafts as a studio-based activity by the few, of the few, for the few. Bless William Morris and his ilk, whose art and craft movement in the 19th century in a post-industrial world, waking up to monoculture, impacted the elite pursuit of aesthetics. Negotiating the culture of the colonized in their effort to understand the other, the British went about setting major centers of teaching arts and crafts in our part of the world. The Mayo College of Arts and Crafts, Lahore. The JJ School of Arts and Crafts, Mumbai. Pedagogy is clubbing arts and crafts at the presidency of Bengal and Madras, coming up with a whole new ideas of design. The Tigors at Shanti Niketan indigenized the search for a new India, seeking an exclusive future for our past. They were artists, I call the lost generation, that reinvented local metaphors for new creative frontiers. Post-independence, India's Babudum, still recovering from the imperial system of governance and its top-down approach, created its own hierarchies. We dropped craft from the teaching curricula of art schools. The Brown Sahibs bifurcated handmade as hastashilp, separating fine arts as Lalitkala. Although the original preamble of the Lalitkala Academy under the Department of Culture did not make any such differentiations. India's fine artists made the academy their own stronghold, distinguishing themselves from craftspeople. Hastashilp was relegated for traditional artisans with a department of handicrafts set up under the purview in those early days as the Ministry of Foreign Trade. The government only took notice of traditional skills as possibilities for export and developmental support depended on the size and scale of craft clusters with the potential for employment. Kamla Devi and Pupul Jaikar worked very hard to change their high and lowness in Indian creative journey. Forming a board of craftspeople as stakeholders with knowledgeable experts, Gira Sarabhai, with a discerning contemporaneity added the pedagogy for new directions with National Institute of Design. What one found problematic with World Craft Council, even then, was that while we looked at crafts as a livelihood for millions, 
developed societies treated their hand skills differently. What they deemed as new crafts could actually easily be replicated by the many in countries with low wages. The scale of what was possible could be economically and sociologically quite intimidating. So our handicrafts, even with their uniqueness, have remained downsized as traditional artisan wear, while studio-based crafts of the developed world attained a higher status with much better price tags. Market-driven recognition catering to a broad base of varied consumers, whether they be local, regional, national, international, comes out of building brands. People feel secure and find them so reliable, even if the prices are high. That's very okay, and it must continue to be so, especially if it's handmade. But the same must apply for the handmade from our part of the world too. Too many hands can't mean too little. So the term handicraft, however, like hand-spun khadi in Gandhi's India, has become an elephant in a dark room. It is much abused label, no longer certifying the use of skilled hands as a principle in its manufacture. In this age when the mechanization determines the role of hand, head and heart, so-called labor-saving tools have started to devalue human touch, impacting the feel and look of anything made by hand. I would have preferred the title for my intervention today to be Creative Frontiers for Working with Hands in the Age of the Artificial Intelligence, or How to Stay a Step Ahead of the Machine, or How to Tell the Real Handmade from the Fake Machine Made, and this is not about crafts being traditional or non-traditional. So let's take up the first word in the title given to me today, the temporal adjective current. Like contemporary or modernist, it points to a thinking that relegates traditional arts to a sunset sector, barely suffered for its sentiment and made sick with inefficient subsidy. This sector is deprived of modern mapping, appropriate technological interventions, economic investment and marketing outreach. Yet, however, knowledge systems have never been static. Traditions are alive because they are dynamic, because they change, develop, transform, shape and further. The traditional is also informed by innovators, although it manifests as a collective expression. Individuals seeking to improve the quality of our lives continue to make us whole, disrupting, defining defi diverse skills. 40 years ago, I met Rahim Bhai, living in a colony of biscuits in near Bombay. He felt an urge to create unique clay amphoras for his personal maikhana. This imaginative maker found a way to fire his delicate creations buried in the low and slow heat of ash kept in tin can canisters used for storing biscuits. Rahim Bhai's eccentric forms became a rage within his community, but couldn't take off in the market because support recognizing a handicraft required official sanction as a bureaucratically designated cluster of traditional skills. So another farmer in Haryana made this, it's meticulously developed indigenous tools and agile fingers while waiting for his crops to ripen. Miniature Gandhi's spinning cotton were trapped in a whiskey bottle. Resonating his own sense of humor, he taught his neighborhood to recycle alcohol bottles with gods and goddesses appearing within. Yet no one saw this as a craft or current trend with the legitimacy of skill or commerce. Here is Bhattobai, who made a doll from scrap uh, 30 years ago, refashioned in a city slum in Gwalior for an exhibition I made in the 70s. After she died, the last dolls disappeared. And what about the anonymous untrained sculptors creating dinosaurs and motorbikes with aluminum and plastic wires, weaving baskets out of telephone cables, as in South Africa? And are legendary boat builders, are they mapped? 
and bullock cart makers today as new transportation takes on high tech. Some extraordinary creations I have had the privilege of working with creators uh, include ephemeral effigy makers creating Ravanas that we set on, set on fire each year. Anthasias, here today, gone tomorrow. Here is what we did this year during the pandemic, a green Durga, a Corona Ravana, and a COVID Lanka, with physical but not social distancing. Nate Chand, a story keeper in the Public Works Department, PWD, secretly created a rock garden in his, pa in his paradise in Chandigarh before it became world famous as the work of an outside artist. I believe my current practice has been as old as my career, transgressing conventional lines set up for interior architecture. Hopefully, I'll be able to add a few more years to the last five decades of renewal and invention. One will continue to celebrate the work of hands as a prerequisite in whatever I do. I'm committed to a very vulnerable present, getting a sense of a more tenacious future. Now, let me share with you how traditional masters themselves feel about the word current. Most of them lack the English vocabulary, but the quality of their experience has its own edgy meaning. Uh, here is Ganga Devi from Madhubani. She places a holy book Ramayan on any surface she begins to paint. She slides it along consecrating each space just before her brush picks colour. Once I saw a pot of ink spill accidentally. She winced for a moment. But unlike most traditional artists, continued to paint on it, in it. The blob of black turned into a massive cave for the tiger of the goddess. So the gods willed, she exclaimed. Her contemporary Chandrakala Devi, whose husband was a railway ticket collector, once told me that while travelling in a train every day, with all the movement within and without, she saw the whole holy epic of Mahabharata appear on all the walls in the toilet. If creative can ha creativity can happen there, she believed it can happen be anywhere. So I helped her create installations for the first time in Pepe Mashi, extending her skills of making grain jars and small ritual votives of Shama Chakeva into 3D sculptures. Here Sita Devi is painting over her forms to create a marriage scene for my exhibition. Kesariya Ram from a village near Agra made this stone bench in collaboration with Mario Bellini for my Golden Eye exhibition in New York. His idea of the grooves carved on the surface was his own, making gullies to drain rainwater. Here are a few more prototypes from my exhibition at the Cooper Hewitt Museum in 85, 1985, showing traditional skills interface with contemporary sensibilities of creators who are more than architects, designers or craftspeople. There's Charles Moore working on this with Banaras toy makers, Bernard Rudowski with Babu Lal and his earth shoes, Fry Otto with Gopi Lal Lohar, the, for cutlery, with damascening, furniture with Zubair Ahmed, pottery from Khurja, Teji Ben tent, which were manifested in many different forms with Zandra Rhodes later, Ethure Sotsa stableware and console with Agra inlay and Chenna Patna wood turners. Look at this Banjara embroidery made a hundred years ago. Would you call this a traditional motive or a current design? Its makers said, no five fingers are alike. So why should what comes out of a hand be uniform? I've collected of 6,000 painted scrolls made by Patuas of West Bengal, traditional picture storytellers who are also painters and lyricists. Apart from repertory of ancient tales, they enjoy creating narratives about the French Revolution or tsunami with the last ones being for our foundation, the Asian Heritage Foundation, on the corona pandemic. Art scholars refer to these artists as folk art craftspeople, while a famous Indian painter, Jamini Roy, influenced by their work, is called a modernist and a fine artist. So the art craft conundrum 
I think is a hopeless colonial construct. And I consider it our excess baggage that will take a few more years to shed. Manjeet Baba here with Chandrakala Devi, a famous Indian painter. Likewise, Jatin Das with his lac work. This is all happening in Dongar at a tribal festival that I did about 30 years ago. Look at what my dear friend Salima Hashmi of College of Art Lahore has done, offering graduate courses in a traditional miniature painting for a whole new generation. Look at Madhvi Parikh doing work with, with, uh, with, with Patimashi and with lacquer work to create hats and toys. Remember the word craft has lately been devalued in the Western world also. New York opened its Museum of Contemporary Craft in 1956, renamed it American Craft Museum in 1979, finally changed it to the Museum of Arts and Design in 2002, dropping the word craft altogether. This takes me to the second word in the title given, defining also this council's raison d'etre. I've already alluded to the term crafts being classified in India as a handicraft employing millions. Crafts in Central Asia, of course, is a hugely different thing and must be addressed, I think, differently to what the rest of the world, the developed world, see them. However, uh, my grandmother spun this pasham for my shawls, as indeed she wove all the drawstrings, drawstrings for my pajamas on a homemade loom set up seasonally in the courtyard. She didn't see her strenuous work as labor or call it handicrafts. Every woman with a household skill, like in the Northeast, represents the bottom of a huge pyramid we call crafts. It is current as their own quality of life. I feel the WCC has to address this humble base of craft with urgency. It really wants to further the everyday culture of making, doing and being. Millions of incredible hands don't see their skill as current, a tradable commodity. But making something for themselves or the family is an eternal act of affirmative endearment. So how do arts and crafts organizations address this basic human need? I feel our approach uh, as craft organization is as important as people passionate about promoting hobbies. I'm not downsizing anything. Let me shared two views from my exhibition at the Smithsonian and Barbican in the 80s, showing what can happen when we turn household skills into a livelihood, we call it uh, Sone Pesuhaga, luster on gold, as seen here with Madhubani and Mithila art, or as magical pictograms of the tribals, Saras and Warlis with their ritual wall paintings, or as Chandrakala Devi, a uh, newfound expression in, in Pepe Mashi. Our critical concern, I feel, must reinforce recognition, reinforcing the vital connection between hand, eye, and the spirit. The emotional retina staying always a step ahead of the machine to remain current forever. For me, craftspeople, very important people whose hands are connected to the brain, and heart, offering us what only they can make with their minds, who see handwork as the only viable alternative to poverty, or at worst, migration in search of small earnings to the city. I feel that the, for example, the jharu makers, the indigenous broomstick makers, who migrate from village from time to time, represent a skill worth supporting. But in a world replete with the vacuum cleaners, we will only start to map the variety of brooms made in any region once we officially classify it as a skill and find ways to market it. Gandhiji queried, produced by the masses or mass produced, as seen in the Nayador a film made in the 50s on the whole idea of handmade. What we really need to work on is the living conditions of millions of self-employed people existing in the fringes of society with only their hands to support them. 
has the contribution to economic indices so gracelessly dismissed as unorganized ever been measured? It is not merely about what is sold in urban emporia or airports or what comes out of a city studio, nor is it really about what is made in mud huts forming a cluster. Maybe it's not even about the so-called handicrafts constituting the bulk of our experts today, churned out in factories in towns nearby. Making assembly line products doesn't mean that the anonymous artisans are not capable of making things with greater artistry. This is an issue the World Craft Council must explore and help reinvent for the world of automation, marginalizing this instrument. Safeguarding personal uh, succumb, satisfaction of the skilled and upskilling them in the humdrum of manufacture, I think is imperative. Jogging jaded perceptions and exercising our five fingers each day in a world forgetting that this connection with the brain must feature in mainstream agendas of not just world bodies, but every school and college. I'll come to pedagogy in the end. I've tried to extend the practice of our foundation, AHF, to turning every artisan hub into crucible for creative enterprise, helping artisans themselves become interpreters of emerging, emerging needs. You're looking at slides of my work at, in Rotak in a village for where I'd set up the Dehati Kala Kendra for rural crafts for rural consumers, helping to bring out creative in everyone with an emotional connect with the handmade, with new, new ideas. Now, but the real handmade, informed by such agility and subtle action, motivated by a story that moves you, cannot be replaced by anything made by super duper gadgets. Look at this Aikat, for example. One is machine, the other from Central Asia, the other is, I mean, machine printed, the other one, or silk screen, and the other one is actually resistant, dyeing each thread to create a pattern once it's put on loom. Uh, today, the world is rapidly configured ways to produce anything without dissemination. Look at these examples of weaving, printing, embroidery, or painting. Changing our interface with the skilled. So the WCC also has to distinguish and certify the real from the fake. It must convince governments to promote the handmade 101% as never before. Many khadi or cottage industries enterprises with their fancy bleeding hearts boutiques make a pretense of helping poor craftspeople, claiming benefits for promoting heritage with tags of fair trade. In fact, several of them hide exploitative work conditions and polluting processes camouflaged under the term handicraft. Few classifications to certify 100% handmade will also have to be formed with active search for carbon footprints, calibrated with the parameters of environment and social factors. All about factor four, even four times removed from the price we pay for a product. Here, handmade will score well, becoming more competitive. Here are a few examples of what our geo enterprise is making to explain empowerment with new craft design, bamboo, in Sabai, the grass where women worked and earned for 15 rupees a kilo are now making lamps and lights and earning 10 times that amount. Or wallpapers, whether they be in Cone Tribal or in Kalamkari or in, or in um, miniature paintings. Or Susni, uh, the, the embroideries of women uh, with an asymmetry that only eyes and hands can produce the more sexy term design described with no word in any Indian language and there are many. Uh, the occupation designer is hijacked by fashionistas, lifestyle pundits, gadget gurus, even social engineers designed for life. I've been looking for a more suitable word that might explain my transdisciplinary and sensory approach in whatever I do. Curators have no Hindi translation, the word curator. So I'm a bit wary of it. At an international showroom for crafts, you may chance upon this mask or this painting, but our craft boards are not there to tell you 
that the artisan making the mask or the painting is a, on, on a picture scroll is also a dancer, a singer and a lyricist. So Charles Eames would say everything connects, which could well be the hashtag of my life. We also have our own Vishnu Dharmotra Puran, an exchange between the Sage Markandeya and King Vajra. It says, to be an architect, you live, you have to be a dancer, a dancer to be a sculptor, a musician to be a poet, and on and on. So why are we making ourselves so incomplete, putting creativity into silos or leaving the arts to the artists and crafts to the craftsmen? The American philosopher Lauren Esley wrote, that one cannot pluck a flower without troubling a star. As the Jains call it Divzaya, this is an interior the house that I've done in Ahmedabad, which follows Jain ideas to create artworks. It's life's interdependence. Or what the one and only Ila Ben talks about as Anuband, being inventive with whatever we have around us. To do this, we need to distinguish need from greed, to do more with less and be dev devoted to something larger than design. Rejoice in the deeper sense of being, of bhakti. Divine meaning is a prerequisite to any profound act of creation. The forced absence of the spiritual makes us cynical. So-called rationalists or trend seekers devaluing this critical dimension. Uh, Time-honored quests of living communities have always reflected the arts, marking tangible, the high points of human ingenuity and dignity. The intangible presence of the divine, religious or otherwise, has inspired seminal works in literature, philosophy, metaphysics, architecture, music, dance, sculpture, and theater. This equation is likely not to change. It's what the Sufis call fanaha zikr. Oh, two plus two is never four in the realm of the spirit. And without it, there is no creation. So finally, to help you decide whether what I do is current, craft or design, I will take you through a short journey with a few of my personal projects. The stories I'm trying to tell over many decades involve merging theatre, design, film, crafts and arts with compelling social narratives while reaching out to a public differently exposed to immersive art experiences, I tried to devise highly crafted and layered installation designs long before any of us had heard the term scenography. Those were from a pavilion that I, we did called Ekyatra on family planning in 72. It's our, it's our first intervention as a group called Idli. Uh, actually, I only become a scenographer after a court dispute in the year 2000, while creating the theme pavilion for Expo 2000 in Hanover, the German government felt more comfortable engaging with a company formally registered as sonographer. The tax administration of Government of India, however, never heard the term and mistook sonographer for stenographer, and the matter had to go all the way to the Supreme Court to be resolved. So in 1998, I was invited by the German government to create one of the six theme pavilions for the turn of the Millennium Expo 2000 in Hanover. I was given the theme of basic needs and also free hand with lots of support to select my team of eminent environmentalists, pioneering theatre groups like Bread and Puppet Theatre in the USA, a little bit of which you will see right now. Working with several grassroots enterprises from 30 different countries, one created this award-winning 70,000 square foot multicultural pavilion. The Basic Needs Pavilion was hailed by the international press as the apex of the World Fair. The German government also equipped my office, perhaps for the first time, with enough material resources to exercise some of my enduring fantasies. The Expo gave me an international opportunity to deal with questions on need and greed, of human survival, the dangers of consumerism and its ravaging impact, on carbon footprints and what people can do to empower sustainability. In 2002, I returned to the Smithsonian after the Festival of India in 1985 with Yo-Yo Ma 
to scenograph the Unparalleled Silk Road Festival, involving craftspeople, performers, change makers from over 22 countries, celebrating the concept of building bridges and connecting cultures. Uh, if you notice the, the big uh, domes in Samarkand, Uzbekistan, and the capital of America in the back, telling these Americans where these uh, forms also appeared. They were names of countries that they couldn't pr pronounce because it was just after 9-11. This was uncomfortable with so many tra strange artists, many from Islamic countries on the National Mall, mixing with millions, laying out artistic handmade renditions on major landmarks from Venice, Istanbul, Bamiyan, Samarkand and Jian to Nara, and devising them as architectural sentinels of arrival along the East Rex axis of the National Mall in Washington. Millions of visitors of the National Mall seem to be enthralled. Kilometers of handmade boundary walls, hand-painted tents, and props over the central vista of Washington, D.C. were all made in India. The media once again acknowledged that they had never seen an event as evocative in this scale before. Simultaneously, I was appointed the chief sonographer of Goodwill Ambassador and member of the Senate Committee for the Universal Forum of Culture, 2004 in Barcelona. I also conceived, designed and produced the Sky of Aspirations, workshops developed in several continents and finally installed in Barcelona. The Tree of Life installations on microcredit at Barcelona included handcrafted paper props with popular pictorial traditions and textile architecture coming together. Around the world, we've arranged live theatre with 50 with craftspeople, performers, over many months, workshops and participative improvisations. That was a backdrop for direct marketing of products made by micro-enterprises, especially from South Asia. During Aditi and Golden Eye, my exhibition, showcasing numerous rural craft skills, uh, the craftspeople earned a total of about $2 million. The exhibition as a whole generated revenues of about three and a half millions. It cost our government much less than about a quarter of a million. This was in the last century, in the 80s. There are at least a thousand such international events around the world, while hundreds of skills can have a profitable presence. Now compute the numbers, and let me add to the next big shelf of what I think will require crafts. Uh, this is my T2, my airport project in Bombay, where the 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 owners, the Reddies, agreed to put 2% of all building act, the amount they spent on the building towards crafts and to create it with artisans, with artists. And that is what resulted in this three mile artwork with three more artworks, which we will show at another time. These are some of the views of houses that I've done using crafts and hotels. Now, since my time is really up, I was given 35 minutes. I, this is on infrastructure and arts, engineering and arts and engineering and crafts. And this is a much longer discourse. And uh, from where I come, uh, having, a, having no sense of time is considered a, a value. But I respect that there's a, a long way to go and other speakers waiting. So I would cut short my presentation here. I was going to speak about the remaining part of what I want to do is on pedagogy, on setting up a university for creative and cultural enterprises 
and a virtual domain for teaching crafts in, on digitally for people all over the world, uh, which is called Hindustan Ki Hunar Shala. But that is something that I will be happy to share with you if you can come on to the AHF website or in places where I may be able to complete this lecture and again put it on the YouTube for your, for your, uh, for your gracious concern. I thank you uh, uh, deeply and I'm, I'm so happy to be a part of a, a Central Asian consciousness that I hope is going to continue to inspire us growing from India to South Asia. I now say I'm Sesha, South Asian. Here's a pool of lotuses from Afghanistan to Nepal to Bhutan to Bangladesh to Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Maldives and Pakistan with India geopolitically also in the center. Uh, I'm committed to a more regional partnership. I call myself South Asian and the slogan for it would be a great way to end this is that diversity, connectivity, empowerment, peace. Thank you. She can read the questions and answers. Can, can, I, can I speak first? Can we thank Mr. Rajiv Sethi for that wonderful, amazing story that he has shared with us? And it will be a real dream for all of us to take it with us because this is really unusual, delightful, and I feel that if there are questions to Mr. Rajiv, he will take the questions. Aziz? Ms. Rajapuzia, um, we have a question from Dr. Kevin Murray. It would be interesting to learn from Mr. Rajiv, said he, whether he saw a need for organizations like his and WCC to help preserve crafts by documenting them? Or is there other dangers in putting craft in aspic? Uh, I, I think your, you, your two questions are very connected. Uh, there are many organizations that are actively involved in conserving, preserving and nurturing the creative. I've, it's too, I've already taken much longer than I had promised and there are other speakers. I would love any questions that do require serious consideration to be perhaps asked me, asked of me uh, directly and I would do it. But in all fairness to my, the other speakers and to the organizers, uh, uh, that if we could, uh, if we could do this uh, at another time, because uh, these questions are very important, and I think uh, they cannot just have a, a, a very standard, uh, easy, short reply. But I, I thank Razieji for having given more time, and I really believe that we should. Uh, my question time is already been taken up by my presentation, and you've all been very gracious. I do believe the other speakers who are waiting now should be coming on, and I'd be very happy to be always available at the Asian Heritage Foundation site or wherever you ask me to come or to personally answer any issues that are coming up from this particular symposium. But meanwhile, I thank you with all my heart. Yes, I, 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 I got the message, Mr. Rajiv Sethi, and a promise is a promise. Did you hear that? Yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. I'm always, always with you. I, I'm sure we, that you have given us that. We will follow up, and we will do that pretty soon. And I think That's you have actually put on such a wonderful story within a story within a story that difficult as you say in so short a time to unravel all the wonders and all the things that have been put together because each is a story by itself it's a big volume and i think once we want to dissect that into strips and then we can get our team to meet with you 
Thank you. That, that should be perhaps the next step we should do. Since you are there for us, we would love to have that. Thank you. But perhaps I could just say to all the participants what I did not say at the beginning because I wanted to carry on the story of the amazing story from Usha to you. And that is, you were honoured by the government of India in 1986 with the award of the Padma Bhushan, which is India's third highest civilian award from the government. And I think that was way back in 1983 when we were just, just fresh talking about crowds with Kamala Devi and all the Gandhians. But how, how can I, I feel so small to talk about such a great, iconic, international person like you. So may I conclude by thanking you on behalf of the WCC but please stay on, Mr. Rajiv, because we have two more speakers and we would like to share. Of course, most certainly, most certainly. Thank you, with all my heart. Thank you, Mr. Rajiv. Sir. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just as a way of introduction, and before I go to my topic, um, uh, listening to Rajiv said, and indeed, uh, Madam Chair, uh, as you have announced and you've shared, he's provided us the wisdom, the experience and the knowledge and the insights of where we should travel in relation to and how we should navigate. For he, like sentinels, has seen and continues to watch out. And who are we but to follow his wisdom and his insights? And it was a, a truly uh, um, a grand occasion for him to be leading our uh, our talk this evening or at least this evening for us here in sydney so thank you rajiv uh, very much uh, in your footsteps but i am but a minnow uh, in uh, in terms of where you are and where home is in terms of everest uh, but i will keep knowing and keep uh, at it to ensure that ours is protected and ours is maintained in the small time that I have. 